just a heads up, this will be live streaming on Make Magazine's uh, Facebook page as well. So uh, if at any time you get logged off, you can also log into the um, Make Magazine um, Facebook page. You can see it there. All right. Um, can I get a thumbs up from the attendees um, that you see the screen and you hear us all clearly? Yeah. In the chat. Great. OK, well, um, welcome, everybody, to the final presentations of the Growing Beyond Earth Maker Challenge year two. Uh, it's been really exciting to see all of the progress over the last uh, few months, and um, we are excited to see your, your final presentations. So, um, of course, this is all possible with uh, the NASA grant that is funding um, the challenge and all the work that uh, Fairchild has been doing with uh, collecting data on uh, the plant growth uh, for the International Space Station. And, um, and to host this challenge every year. This is the uh, second year out of three years of the challenge. Um, Institute of Museum and Library Services as well, and make projects for hosting the, um, the submissions page. And Fairchild, uh, Amy, if uh, you wanna take over and uh, do a little introduction on you all and um, Carl. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you all for being here. We're excited to see the work that you've created, um, you know, see your presentations uh, and really be able to ask some questions. So my name is Amy Padoff, and I am the very proud director of education at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. We also have with us uh, Dr. Carl Lewis, uh, the director of the garden. Um, you probably all know our faces from past uh, uh, presentations. Um, we're excited to host you. Like uh, Tom said, we have been um, working with NASA for the last six years uh, to help them identify edible plants for long distance space travel. So not only are we now identify, helping to identify the best crops, you know, doing crop selections, we're also helping to work out some of the technology issues for growing plants for long distance in space travel. So your um, submissions have been really helpful for us and uh, we're excited to have you. Carl, anything you wanna add? Oh, just wanna mention that uh, for those of you who have been following this project and been, been with us in the past, I'm coming to you live from our innovation studio. This is the makerspace, the first ever makerspace in a botanic garden. And you can see the, the inside of the space uh, what you can't see is the setting here, which is absolutely incredible. We're in the rainforest section of Fairchild Garden, which is located in Miami. So it's really steamy outside with palm trees and orchids and all sorts of things. So you go through the rainforest and you enter this uh, maker space. It's really quite extraordinary. We're so proud to be able to have this here. Um, so this is the local Miami component of what you all are working on around the country. So just wanted to explain how this is all coming together. We're so proud as a botanic garden to be, to be part of this and uh, just so grateful for NASA and our, our great uh, panelists who are with us today. Uh, and uh, especially to all of you for all the hard work you've done over the past several months. It's just, it's just amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carl. All right, and uh, myself, uh, Tom Pupo from Moonlighter Fab Lab. We've been um, really excited over the last couple of years to work with Fairchild to help them um, design the makerspace and uh, run these challenges and do all sorts of uh, STEAM educational programming at Fairchild. So this has been an, an exciting journey for us as well. And so um, as far as the, the judging panel goes, uh, you have myself and Ian who are from a makerspace background. Um, and then we have the NASA panelists uh, who are um, scientists and engineers and botanists. So I do want to give a, a, a quick chance for everyone to uh, introduce themselves and uh, give their background as to what they'll be bringing to the table in, uh, in the questions. So Ian, actually go ahead and we'll start with you. Hello, uh, my name is Ian Cole. Uh, I'm on the uh, board for Nation of Makers as well as uh, I helped uh, start and run uh, MakerFX Makerspace in Orlando, Florida, as well as uh, Maker Fair Orlando. And uh, for my 
uh, day job, I'm the CIO for uh, Give Kids the World in Kissimmee, Florida. Awesome. Joya? Hi, everyone. I'm Joya Massa. I'm a plant scientist at Kennedy Space Center, and I support um, our space crop production efforts. Um, you know, I just want to thank you all for participating. Thank the amazing folks at Fairchild who, who had this idea and, and made it happen and wrote all the proposals, did all the legwork, and, and, and the folks at, at Moonlighter Fab Lab who really made it, made it come alive. So this is just great. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Ralph. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, probably most of you have seen me from the last time. Uh, my name is Ralph Ritchie. I'm the Space Crop Production Project Manager for NASA at the Kennedy Space Center. So I have the extreme pleasure and honor of working with Dr. Massa and a team of scientists and engineers who are trying to solve these challenges um, in application for deep space exploration. So um, thank you for your support. I'm excited to see the progress you've made from last time. Awesome. And I see Jacob Torres, but I'm not sure if he has his mic on. Um, Jacob, we're just doing quick introductions. If you can sure. unmute. Sure, yes. Um, I apologize that my video isn't working, but my name is Jacob Torres. I'm an engineering plant scientist at Kennedy Space Center. Um, I get to work with Joya and Ralph. I spend a lot of time in the lab um, designing and building these uh, equipment and stuff that grows plants in space. So I bring a, a perspective of uh, actually building and putting the components together. And I'm really excited to see all of your projects and proposals. Um, so thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited. Thank you. Awesome. Great. And again, thanks to Nation of Makers um, for being a wonderful partner over the last couple of years um, and for giving us a wonderful platform and gather to uh, showcase everybody's um, projects in a completely new way. So if you haven't had the chance to do so, um, I, I highly recommend going to uh, the Gather platform from NomCon and walk through everything. I think it's there's a ton of, of, of things to see there, but in particular for this project, the Growing Beyond Earth Hall has um, the virtual PDF presentations from each of the teams and uh, a short video about their projects. And there's tons of videos on there about Fairchild's work and from NASA's work. And uh, there's just a lot of fun things to, to check out in there. So um, be sure to do that if you haven't done so yet. And kudos to Tom uh, for designing that platform, that, that space. It is really amazing. It's super interactive. And I hope you get a chance to play around in there because it's really great. I have to admit, as a maker, it was a lot of fun to play around with that, that platform. <laughs> so uh, once again, you know, just we don't want to... Um, uh, go over the same thing over and over again. I know you all have been with us for a couple of years now, but for those of uh, watching online, uh, Growing Beyond Earth Maker Contest essentially is calling on makers across America to submit new designs for vegetable garden systems to be used aboard uh, the International Space Station and beyond. So um, the idea here is that as NASA continues missions uh, further out into space, uh, we need to bring uh, plants with us and we need to automate those systems as much as possible. So uh, this is the second year out of three years. The first year challenge, uh, if you go to the website, you'll be able to see the winners from that, that challenge. It's also on the gather platform on the, on the top left side. Um, and that was focused purely on the efficient use of the three-dimensional space, the 50 centimeter cubic space that we have in the, in the um, veggie chamber. And so utilizing all that space within a zero gravity environment to uh, grow as much edible biomass as possible, right? Year two this year, we're focused all on, on uh, maintaining those plants without any human intervention. So automating those processes as much as possible. Um, and that could be with uh, different electronic sensors and microcontrollers. Um, and we've seen teams that have done a different approach as well. So as long as uh, it's an, a hands-off system that we can get plants at the end of a 28 day uh, growing period without having the, the um, folks on board uh, have to maintain it over that, that whole time period. And then um, the third year will be all about robotic planting and harvesting. So we're really excited for that, that next year challenge and see how all these projects then grow on to um, incorporate those, those new elements. So without further ado, we'll get started with uh, the year two finalist presentations. Um, we'll start with the high school category and let me take a look at the participants we have online. 
um, if uh, the main presenter from Cami can just click on the raise hand uh, button. Yep. Okay, perfect. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. So, um, Chris, you should be promoted to panelists. Yes. Awesome. Are you able to share your screen? I am uh, ready to go. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here again. Um, I'm the faculty advisor for Noah Kay and Noah Berlin, who are two eighth graders at uh, West Hollow Middle School in Long Island, New York. They just finished up finals yesterday and are actually on their way to summer camp this morning. So uh, they really wanted to be here to present in person because, I mean, these two boys have been over the moon, um, you know, pun intended, you know, with this whole thing. And uh, they really wanted a chance to uh, present to you all. So what they've done is pre-recorded their PowerPoint, and I'm just going to play that video for you all now. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to allow us to introduce you to our phase two submission of CAP, the Computerized Agriculture Monitoring Interface. We are Noah Kay and Noah Berlin, and we are currently eighth grade students at West Hollow Middle School in Long Island, New York. We have spent the last two years studying controlled environment agriculture in both, in both our science class and after school coding and engineering club. Our goal is to apply our knowledge of plant science, the engineering design process, robotics, and programming for funding solutions for growing food in alternative environments. With our ever-increasing world population, erratic climate conditions, and depleting na natural resources, we recognize the need to find innovative methods for producing food. As our capabilities for sending manned missions deeper into space continues to grow, we also see our projects having applications for the ISS and beyond. This is the main reason why we refer to our lab as our Mars farm. We made use of CAD and 3D printing, electronics, and coding, and applied them within our design challenge. It is a space where we have experimented with over three dozen species of plants and developed ways to automate their growth through the use of environmental robotics. For our initial submission, our focus was to bring the projects that we had worked on throughout our lab into a footprint that was comparable to the veggie system currently being used on the ISS. This involved incorporating 18 environmental sensors that could monitor atmospheric and root zone conditions, as well as 11 actuators in the form of peristaltic pumps, DC fans, and relay-controlled grow lights and irrigation pumps. We also used a small autofocus artery cam to run time lapses and have live look-ins on the growing environment. In total, we were able to account for nearly 20 different environmental variables associated with our growing cycles. Because this project was something that's being scaled down to fit within the units of five dust that are going beyond Earth's challenge, we also feel it can be scaled back up to meet the needs of a full farm once colonization of extraterrestrial habitat had been accomplished. We understand that the intent of this challenge was to automate the growth of the crop with 28 days without human intervention. However, through our study of growing plants in space and our discussions with experts about presenting our work, we have come to realize how important the care of these crops can be for the well-being of crews on board the ISS. To this end, we have also designed a graphical user interface using Adafruit IO that allows the astronauts to manually control all aspects of the system. By simply toggling from auto to manual mode, they can administer adjustment solutions, initiate feedings, and modify the environment by controlling the fans and photo period of the growing. Additionally, the state of all atmospheric and root zone variables can be accessed anytime and from anywhere. We have designed the widgets so that if any variable falls outside of the predetermined set points, they will change from green to red, indicating that the act, that action should be taken. Given that this information is all online, it can be done by the astronauts remotely while on missions or can be done on their behalf by members monitoring the food from mission control. For phase two prototype, we made many adjustments to the configuration of the growing area, as well as the placement and collection method of our sensors. We completely switched our growing method from soil-based to a deep water culture method of hydroponics. This was due to the fact that we brought our water reservoir into the growing area to meet the space constraints. 
Given that the success we have seen in our models fund, we thought this will also allow for increased root mass that directly accesses the nutrient-rich water sitting beneath the plants. To simulate the patches we've been seeing used on the ISS, we filled permeable mesh bags with coconut coir as our growing medium. Once seeded, they were placed in net cups that rested in the lid of the reservoir. A total of eight sites were equipped with direct injection needles and moisture sensors were within the system. Our phase two crop was Swiss chart due to the success we have had with it in the lab, as well as the nutritional benefits that come with the antioxidants and vitamins it can offer for the crop. Another goal that we had was to clean up the sensors and wires within the growing area. Our atmospheric sensors are now neatly passed to the back panel and the wires are now routed across the top of the reservoir and out through the cable gland sitting behind it. They've also placed a Raspberry Pi touching the top of the unit so the crew members can interact directly with the system to determine threshold set points. The biggest change in our phase two prototype can be seen on the back of the unit. We created a two level fertigation manifold that serves to check water quality and make any necessary adjustments. The top level includes all of our root zone sensors, which take more accurate readings as a stream of water passes across them. In the second level, you will see inlets for six different adjustment solutions that are distributed to the reservoir by way of peristaltic pumps controlled by an Adafruit motor hat. The housings for these pumps and the solution containers were designed using Fusion 360 and 3D printed using PLA. Based on the readings from the pH sensor, the first two pumps administer acid and base solutions to maintain a pH range between 5.5 and 6. Our program included time and constructs and state flats that allowed for the EC of the system to be walked up incrementally to a target of 1.4 by the end of the third week. Three pumps were used to distribute an A and B growing solution along with a calcium magnesium supplement. Beings are added on the 7th, 11th, and 14th of the month. The final pump was included as a precautionary measure in the event the ORP reading fell too far below our target of 400 millivolts. If the root zone environment showed signs of unwanted microbial content, a single dose of hydrogen peroxide was to be administered. We are aware of how sterile the system must be for use on the ISS, but we also did not want to damage the fragile roots of the plants growing above. Fortunately, this measure proved unnecessary during our growth cycle for phase two. In addition to testing and treating the nutrient solution, this circulation system was meant to keep the reservoir continually mixed and oxygenated. The pumps that circulated the water and injected into the roots of the pipes were controlled by relays, triggered by the Raspberry Pi's GPIO pins. We also included an inline flow meter to ensure that this system was operational and adjustments would be possible. Aside from a small leak in the seams of the manifolds early on, it was cured with silicon. This system operated as intended throughout the duration of the cycle. We have two main communication protocols for our sensors. Our first takes advantage of the simple wiring that I2C sensors offer. These addressable sensors monitor water temperature, electrical conductivity for nutrient adjustment, oxidation reduction potential to ensure unwanted microbial growth is kept to a minimum, pH and dissolved oxygen of the nutrient reservoir. Carbon dioxide, temperature and humidity levels are monitored in the canopy area. Luminosity and mixing rate by way of an inline flow meter create closed loop systems that ensure that our circulation and lighting systems have not failed. We had to include an external analog to digital converter for some of our sensors as the Raspberry Pi does not have the ability to make analog readings. To calculate soil moisture, we used an array of four capacitive moisture sensors that each take an average of 20 readings every 10 minutes. This allows the system to know when to administer direct injection of water and nutrients into the root zones of the plant. The food pressure deficit is a variable that we were interested in monitoring in order to control the rate of transpiration for the plants growing in the chamber. In phase one, we used thermistors that were attached to the underside of the leaves in order to monitor the leaf temperature. We used this data and compared it to relative humidity and air temperature surrounding the canopy to calculate the vapor pressure deficit. Once we realized that we could not touch the plants in phase two, we switched to relief temperature monitoring over to no touch IR sensors that were attached to the top of our reservoir. The inspiration from this came from all of the no touch temperature scans they seen being taken in the world around the seventh day. 
We had a target VPD of 0.7 to 0.8 in mind, but the system would not take action unless the VPD fell below 0.2 or rose above 1.4. Under these conditions, an exhaust fan would evacuate the air in the chamber to help lower the relative humidity to increase the VPD. If the VPD became too great, the intake fan would turn off in hopes of slowing the rate of transpiration. In order to keep the cost of equipment down in phase two, we switched our pH or and DO sensors over to analog readings instead of using the more expensive I2C integrated chips. This required us to add a second ADC as well as isolation circuitry to avoid electrical interference from the pumps and sensors in the reservoir. We also had to derive equations that converted the analog voltage output of the sensors to real world environmental readings. Luckily, Atlas Scientific provides excellent documentation that helped us with this effort. Plants were started in the system on May 21st and harvested on June 17th. The average mass per plant was roughly 1,400 milligrams, giving us a total edible mass in our final harvest of 120,000 milligrams. We feel we could have promoted a higher yield had we pushed the maturing plants with nutrients a bit earlier. We waited for two weeks before administering nutrients into the reservoir in, in an attempt to prevent burnout of developing seedlings, which could have kept us from having any results to report. We were really inspired by the presentations of the collegiate teams in this challenge. This summer, it is our goal to develop computer vision and machine learning capabilities in the system. We are hoping to use the camera that we mounted just under our grow lights to be able to conduct a color analysis of the leaves in order to monitor general plant health and identify potential nutrient deficiencies. We would also like to be able to accurately measure the size of developing plants within the system in order to predict and optimize growth rates for future crops. We would once again like to thank Fairchild Botanical Gardens for the opportunity to take part in this challenge. As young engineers, we have had so much fun developing our skills and applying them to something we were already very passionate about. We also appreciate all the valuable feedback we have received from the scientists at NASA and participants in this program. We tried our best to incorporate your suggestions into our phase two submissions. So that is, uh, that's our boys. And I am incredibly proud. So I'll turn it over to you all. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, um... Chris will be able to answer uh, based on, you know, what he's helped facilitate with the with the project. It's, it's really really impressive, Chris. I mean, we're we're pretty blown away by these guys. Um, I I I'm curious about the choice of Swiss chard. You know, I think that's uh, it's a really a great plant, but I'm just wondering what were the reasons that that they chose it. So it, it grows really well in our lab, you know, and they were trying to pull from stuff that they've grown before. Um, it's a pretty hardy green and it always tends to do well in that form of uh, growth for us. So I think they were really shooting on something that could give them the greatest yield in the short window of time that we had. And that was pretty resilient to changes in the system. So it's just something we were familiar with mostly. Yeah, great. It's, it's, it's super nutritious. You know, it's definitely been one of our candidate crops for, for a while now. Um, one of the, the challenges that it, we've had for, for space crops with it is that often the seeds have multiple embryos. And so you can plant one seed, but you don't, you, you might get more than one plant germinating. So I, I guess I wonder if, if you encountered that, if the plants were thinned or if you just left them all growing. Um, we kind of just let them all grow. Uh, we do notice that when it happens and we typically thin them, but in the spirit of, you know, the challenge, we knew that we couldn't get in there and, and you know, manually change anything. Cool. Um, one last question about the, the cups, the net bags that were in there. Were, how were those made? Were they sewn or were they fastened somehow? So we were, we actually found them online. Um, we okay. use them to, to transplant sometimes. We go from our garden uh, and we have a soil-based raised bed down in our cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So it's like the neatest way to kind of pull from one system and put into another. But we also thought it would be good for this application because it could hold our uh, growing medium. And they wanted to try to recreate the, the pouches they see um, on the in Veggie Now 
because they wanted to have those direct injection needles. So we needed something that we could kind of pump into that would contain our stuff and not have all the debris fall down into our reservoir. No, yeah, that's very cool. The roots don't go through it. They stay inside the pouch or they, no, they actually, through? they grow right through it. And, um, you know, that's actually what makes the transplanting so easy. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. And, and Chris, you know, the thing that's, um, always impressed me about you and, and, and the boys are that the, the range of issues and challenges that you've absorbed into the concept, um, and, and you can see that they take them and they understand them and they integrate them as part of the package and they have a plan for the future. They're not, they're not getting hung up in any one area. Um, it, it's, it's extremely impressive that they can integrate all these um, concepts into a system and a design and stay on top of it as well as plan for the future for the next um, round. So uh, yeah, kudos to you and the boys. And I'm just super proud of you guys and everything you've done so far. Cheers, Ralph. Thank you very much. Hey, Chris, this is Jacob. I, I wanted to say hello real quick and just share how exciting this project is. Um, you know, in, in many ways, you know, I look up to your students in the work that they're doing. This project is so diverse and there's so many technologies incorporated into this system. I just think it's, it's, it's just another level, you know, I, it's very impressive. You've just done a great job at leading these boys. I, I want to ask a question and it's, it's also for me as well. And I just, to get your thoughts and maybe the boys thoughts about uh, sensor calibration and, and ensuring that the sensors are speaking valid numbers. Um, you, we're using those to, uh, uh, direct how the system will work and, and grow the plants. Is there a calibration or th issues that you've encountered about sensors along the way with your system? With your yeah, system? so we walk through the calibration protocol for all of the sensors. Um, and then they do a lot of empirical testing too. You know, you might've seen a picture there of NOAA with that sort of array of capacitive sensors because those are pretty wonky and they kind of go bad pretty quickly. So he knew he needed more than one of them if he was gonna trust what was going on. So he had four, each taking 20 readings, taking an aggregate average of all of that stuff. What he didn't get to this time, and he had heard a recommendation from an earlier presentation was, he wants to be able to kind of integrate knowing when a sensor is out of range and then ignoring it. He just didn't have the time to get there with this one. So, uh, that's but that's wonderful. a point. And Jacob, you'd be really, really impressed with the hot pepper tower that the kids did in our lab. They're complete pepperheads now, and you had a lot of lot to do with that. <laughs> That's so awesome! Thank you so much, Chris. Very cool. Yeah, I think the averaging out of multiple sensors is absolutely uh, it, very, very smart and intelligent. I love that. It's great. Yeah, cool. Great job. Thank you. Okay. So, if there's no other questions. Uh, we'll move on to the next team. Is uh, someone present from the Gaia team? Ben Arnold, Nick Hernandez, Jack Dodd, and Chris Olchin. Nicholas, okay. All right. Nicholas, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not the typical person you were expecting. You usually have been here, but unfortunately they couldn't make it. Um, so you have me today, lucky you. Uh, <laughs> no worries. So. We'll do fine. Yeah, uh, I'll start by sharing my screen. Okay, so many of you are familiar. If you aren't, this is uh, the STEAM team in Palmer Trinity School, which is located in Miami. Uh, and our box is called Gaia. So here are the members you might be familiar with or you might not. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't be here today, but they're all great workers. And yeah, uh, just for their recognition. Um, so I'd like to start by talking about our 
design and even though phase two might have not been focused completely on design and more on the technological aspect, we've still been trying our best to improve our design from previous phases. And uh, you can see that in these designs, uh, there's a couple differences. If you ever watch our phase one presentation, uh, you can see that we have uh, a lot sleeker design in my opinion. And I prefer the more uh, I like how there's water reservoirs under it and it's going to be compact with all the sensors and then you have above it is the motor everything and this is just perspective from the left and right if we look from front and back uh, the front is where we're going to have we're planning to have a hinge where you can access the plants and where you can look at all the plants uh, and here's the back as well uh, top and front uh, top and bottom uh, the bottom specifically, I think is very important because you have a lot of uh, intricate things in there, including our sensors and all our uh, water and how our aeroponic, our aeroponic system, which I'll get onto later, because it's very impressive the work that Ben has done uh, on the aeroponic system. So uh, here are some specific uh, design details that we have. Uh, we have a modified aeroponic system uh, uh, we're one of the few teams that uses aeroponics. Uh, and then our circular growth structure, which might have caught the eye of a couple of you, is, we based it off the idea that in space there is zero gravity, so it's not going to be pulled down or anything. So you can grow it all over the place, basically. And it was really helpful to maximize the capacity of all our plants. Uh, we use we went we switched from an Arduino to a Raspberry Pi to control our sensors and just everything that requires the technology. Um, and yeah, it's been a process to do that, you know, completely different coding languages, but I'll get onto that later. Um, so here are specifically the technologies that we've been using uh, for our engineering and for our designing Fusion 360, the modeling software. And then for our programming and to execute our code, we've installed Linux on the Raspberry Pi, and we're planning to uh, attach a device to control uh, the, the aspects of all the device and access all the readings from any of the sensors and all that stuff. So uh, our, the materials that we've used currently in our prototype, uh, you can see that we, ha we have specific uh, We've stated the specific sensors that we've used, uh, as well as the materials that we've used for the outer box, uh, and uh, the sorry, I lost track. Uh, our four lights, which are still a work in progress right now, uh, we're planning on changing them up, and a lot of the materials actually we are still planning on changing them, but this is a good start for us, uh, and. So what we use to build these, uh, these are just tools that we use uh, to either code or to build, to uh, put assemble our ideas together. And here is our final prototype that we have. Uh, so you can see how uh, our lights are placed all four corn, uh, not all four, on all four sides. And then in the center, you have the tube that will be spinning uh, with all the plants inside of it. And this tube is planned to be spinning on a stepper motor. Uh, we're actually now thinking about switching it to a cordless direct driver motor. Uh, and when we were testing our plants, unfortunately, uh, since the tube was black it, and it absorbed a lot of the heat from the lights and it ended up killing all our plants after the second week, which was really unfortunate. But what was really interesting is that we found a study by the University of Michigan that looked into things like this, uh, how having black tubes or growing plants in uh, black tubes absorbs a lot of heat and it ends up killing your plant plants. So we just found support for this conclusion. And the picture here is kind of how it would look like. Uh, it was used, uh, we put kale in from, uh, from Ben's garden that he's been growing. Uh, and this is really what we're trying to get to, but it wouldn't be all lopsided because we're gonna, it's going to be in zero gravity, so it, it wouldn't look exactly like this, but that's the idea that we're going for. 
So I like to talk about our code. I'm part of the programming team. So some of this code has been done by myself. Uh, right now, our code is still uh, incomplete. But we have already most of it down and we know exactly what we're doing uh, with it. So it was a bit of a challenge switching from an Arduino, which uses the Arduino language, which is very similar to C++, to switching to, uh, to Python, which is a simple language to learn. But most of us are actually very uh, well known with Java. So we've been learning like three languages all at once, basically, which was a challenge. Um, so it's been a, a pro it's been a process to code all the all our stuff, but um, we already have code for our motors for most of our sensors, and re really we just need to put it all together at this point and just integrate our how we're going to access our our sensors data and how we are going to access the rotation of the tube in the middle. So uh, I'd like to talk about some of our new ideas and what we are planning to integrate uh, in the coming months. So we have an automated CO2 generator, which is using yeast, uh, something that naturally produces CO2, controlled by a valve that can release CO2 to the plants uh, when, it, when one of our sensors can detect that it's low on it or that it might need some. And some other ideas that we have for, especially for the next phase, our guillotine plant cutting system, which is gonna help a lot with the harvesting of all the plants. And I already talked about the cordless direct drive motor, which uh, is gonna help minimize the space that is taken up by the stepper motor that we are currently using. And it will be a bit more efficient for us. Uh, we're also working on a lot of aeroponics technology, which is really impressive. Uh, what Ben has been doing, it's been, it's been changed from something pretty big and bulky to something incredibly small. If you go to, in the gather, if you go to our high school winners and you find our video, uh, Ben does a great explanation of it, of how he is planning on changing how this entire thing works and compacting it. Because uh, many of you know that uh, the more something weighs is the more expensive it, it is to take up to space. Another thing that we've been working on is a different plant pillow that's smaller than the one that NASA uses. Uh, something that's been, uh, so we've been working on for a while is our developing PCBs. We've been trying to contact electrical engineers because PCB building is very difficult. And we're doing this to, all of this is just to minimize just the weight and to make the design more sleeker uh, than what it is right now. Uh, and another thing that we're changing is the material we're using for the box itself. Uh, we're trying to change it to carbon fiber, which is a lot uh, lighter than what we currently use, as well as uh, new lights that are better. Um, but, you know, lights are expensive, so we're, we're trying to find the middle ground between cheap and really efficient. So here are some of our renderings. And yeah, that's really it uh, for the Gaia team. Again, I'm sorry that Ben couldn't be here. He, this is really his brainchild, but yeah. Awesome job, Nicholas. Do any of the judges have any questions? Yeah, hi, Nicholas, that, that was great. Um, so what is the plan to, to, to solve the problem of the darker material heating up? Uh, probably gonna switch the material, maybe make it a lighter color or just change the entire material completely. Uh, we're still figuring out, cause this was very recent that it, it happened. Um, we're kind of, we're freaking out a bit, but it, it's good to know that there, there is, we found the reason why it happened and how we can change it. So any of those things definitely would work, change it. Were you able to see how hot it actually got? No, we were not. Uh, we're still figuring out ways to read the sensor because since because of quarantine and all of this, we've been very separated from it. So we've been working on our basically individual parts and then right. we're putting it all together. So we found ways to read from the sensors, but we now need to integrate it into the uh, actual to the actual box itself. So we didn't get the temperature of it. 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, you know, a, a real world scenario, like you say, the publications on it. And we actually found a very similar thing um, with the veggie chamber. We didn't really know, but when we started doing the, the light studies where we were looking at different red to blue light ratios, you know, blue light is shorter wavelength, but that also means higher energy. And what we found is that the pillows that were growing under more blue light were, were heating up more. We put thermocouples in them and, and you know, we saw it a couple degrees difference and they were using more water. So the whole light study was confounded by this temperature effect and we had to develop a, a, a white reflective pillow shade that, that we had the astronauts install, you know, that we could then, you know, get, get equivalent um, temperatures inside the root zone, because if your roots heat up, then, you know, it causes all sorts of effects on the plant. So that's a very realistic thing. And it's something that we should have thought of, and we didn't think of either, um, you know, and it, it's just one of those, those things you find out with trial and error. So very good identifying that, and, you know, I think it'll be a pretty straightforward thing to, to fix, but you'll need to obviously test it, but great job. Thanks. Thank you. Um, this is a data sheet. I, I, I really wasn't going to show you it, but um, it's just saying that it, it worked for the first week, and then the second week is when they started dying. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Were, were there kale plants that you were growing, or was it something else um, that you were actually growing? No, we were growing kale plants. Okay, yeah, kale's a great choice. Very nutritious. Yeah. Can I jump in and just say real quick? Um, Nicholas, this is amazing. The amazing part is something that isn't noticed by the untrained eye, I guess I should say. And that's the fact that you were working with multiple coding languages to get this project done, to switch from uh, using you know, uh, one microcontroller to going to the other, and then balancing the languages to do it. Uh, uh, that's just an amazing feat itself. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, th that's going on in the background and people don't notice that. So I just want to congratulate you for pulling it together by the deadline. And, and you actually grew plants. And I think that's amazing. You know, you're, it's just a really cool concept and idea. One thing I'd like to ask is may maybe, can you explain a little bit to me and maybe I um, didn't hear it as well, but how is the water and nutrients delivered to the plant's roots? Um, so what we're planning on doing is a pump uh, and, and uh, it's going to be controlled and it's going to be fed into the aeroponic system. Uh, I'm actually, I, I'm not a leader, so I, I don't know everything about it, but sure, I'm sure. part of the programming team. So it's, but uh, what I do know, and from what Ben has explained in the video that is in the gather uh, area, is that it's going to be controlled by a pump fed into a really small aeroponic system that then feeds it to the plants, basically. That's you. Very cool. As you know, delivering water to the plants' roots in space is one of our biggest challenges. So uh, um, it, it's cool to see that you guys are addressing that by delivering moisture straight to the roots. Um, so it is congratulations on actually growing plants and then learning lessons from it, like the heated surface and then making adaptations to it. It's just a very good, excellent work. Congratulations again. Thank you so much. Any other last questions from the judges? Okay. Well, thanks so much, Nicholas. All right. So next up, we have Alex Foreman from uh, Sequoia School. Uh, do we have someone from that team here to present? You can you click on the little raise hand button in Zoom. Hmm. All right, so it looks like 
uh, we don't have somebody to represent their team, but I do have the video that they uploaded and I can uh, play it for you all now. This is my finished prototype um, for the second phase of the Growing Beyond Earth challenge. Uh, as you can see, my prototype is pretty similar to the, uh, my original design um, with a few notable differences. Uh, first, the main um, carriage that was supposed to slide around uh, this main rod um, was removed uh, on the first day, actually. Um, the, the belt mechanism that moved it along kind of kept jamming and just getting in the way of things. Um, and overall, the mechanism sort of just broke. Um, and yeah, uh, so it was pretty quickly removed. Um, and secondly, uh, the top growth bed that was here in the design um, is not there uh, due to the fact that my design factors in that there is no gravity. Um, so something being upside down is perfectly fine because water won't fall down, it'll just stay there. Um, and that's obviously not the case on Earth. Uh, so water did seep out and pour out of it. Um, so that was also removed or else it would kind of pour water all over the electronics. Uh, that wasn't really a problem with any of the side ones because the water sort of just fell down to the side of the pouches. Um, but yeah, uh, in the end, um, my growth results weren't ideal. Uh, 15 out of the um, 42 possible seedlings um, did sprout uh, with minimal um, plant uh, growth uh, at the end of the 28 days. Um, my main guess is due to the lack of light and light spectrum as well. Um, I, I just don't think uh, they got enough light um, as this breed of lettuce, outrageous red lettuce, should be fully sprouted in 28 days, or sorry, fully grown in 28 days, which it clearly uh, was not. Um, that being said, I think it was still a pretty successful run. Uh, a lot of the design parts of the designs uh, did prove um, successful, such as the autonomous watering system, uh, and lighting system um, and overall I think it was a pretty good test and I think with more uh, time and lighting uh, we could see uh, a larger um, yield uh, in terms of uh, plant growth. Thanks. So although they're not here to present uh, and ask questions um, I think you can take a moment to fill out some of the notes based on the, the video and uh, if you don't have access to the gather platform, uh, judges, I can give you the, the link to a PowerPoint presentation that, that they uploaded as well. So a question, because Alex is the only name there and he was the presenter. Is there anybody else working with him on this project? Or, or? I don't see anybody on, on no, I mean, I, I just see his name on the list. So it might be just, yeah, him alone. Because, you know, that the, it being one person doing a challenge like that, um, is is a different paradigm than working with the team and and so you know he he's he's demonstrating different qualities of his personality and as well of his uh problem solving ability there so i think that's a an interesting thing to factor in i mean it's not something you judge on it's just something to note um so right right yeah and the link uh actually on the uh, judges notes doc the the link to the powerpoint presentation is on the name so if you want to browse through that as well. Um, after the presentations, we can do that together. All right. Uh, and that's it for the high school finalists. We're moving on now to the collegiate finalists, uh, starting with Seed Shuttle, Yuji Wang, Anthony Tang, Leonard Wei, Matt Halleck, and James Road. And I'm bringing them on to the panelists now. All right, fellas, you have the floor. Awesome.
Okay. So hello everyone. We're um, GrowTech at Berkeley, a club that specializes in the intersection between plant biology and engineering. We're proud to present Seed Shuttle V2.0, which is an iteration of our previous design we submitted last year. Um, this year we focused more on automation and we were able to achieve some pretty interesting results. Before we get into those though, we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Yuji, the second year lead of this club. Hi, I'm Anthony Tan. I'm the resident plant biologist for this year of the contest in this team. And I also serve as the team lead of year one of this contest in which focus on spatial arrangement. Hi, I'm Matt Halleck. I'm a third year and I worked on the automation aspects of this project. I think James might be having some technical difficulties. Um, okay, I think he's rejoining. I just re-added him now, so uh, he should be able to log in now. Awesome, thank you so much. Yuji, could you share the presentation instead of your screen? Because we see, we see the Zoom over the top of the presentation. Oh, that's uh, unfortunate. No problem. Yeah, do that real quick. Thank you. Is that better? Uh, nothing's come up yet. Maybe it takes a minute. Yes. Uh, well, now we see the dark boxes of the Zoom over the top of the presentation. Good stuff. I yeah, think we that. Can't, we can't see James at all on there. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Give me one sec. There we go. I think this will make for a better uh, presentation. That works, thanks. So James Rode, I think, uh, is on now as a panelist. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh yeah, there we go, sorry about that. Yeah, so hello, I'm James Rode. I'm a first generation rising junior who is also the team's plant biologist. I help with some of the uh, design iterations and experimentations for Seed Shuttle. So the challenge, NASA's vegetable production system, also known as Veggie, which is shown here, credits to NASA and Dr. Joya Massa, currently supports six plants in an upward growth orientation, all in the same growth phase. Our goal is essentially to design a microgravity compatible plant growth chamber that maximizes production while also adhering to the volumetric constraints of a 50 centimeter cube and including all required features for plant growth, such as light, humidity, air, nutrients, and temperature. Our foundational design, Seed Shuttle, which won at the collegiate level for the 2019 and 2020 uh, GPE competition, features a fourfold increase in production in comparison to NASA's veggie, as Seed Shuttle produces a total of 24 plants and yields 12 mature heads of lettuce every two weeks. Uh, whereas NASA's veggie system houses a total of six plants and yields six mature heads of lettuce every four weeks. We were able to increase the capacity through growing plants in different growth phases, along with uh, taking advantage of the microgravity environment to allow different growth orientations. And a closer look. So Seed Shuttle features a radial design, which is comprised of three layers that hold eight plants each, which allows for alternating growth phases uh, to a total of 24 plants, like I said before, or 12 heads every two weeks. This is a fourfold increase in production compared to NASA's veggie system. Okay, so let's take a close look at the harvesting and the planting in this system. So there's four panels. These are a top-down view of the chamber. You can see in the first panel, there's four mature heads of lettuce that are growing towards the corners, and there's four half mature heads of lettuce going towards the edges. So we, what we want to do is harvest those mature heads of lettuce. Now we're left with four empty spots in the second panel. And third panel, we're inserting pots so that new plants can grow in their place. And of course, we want the largest heads of lettuce to be facing towards the corners in our design. So we simply rotate the barrel scaffold 45 degrees and now 
the largest heads are facing the corners. We conducted plant growth experiments to validate components of our design. So in the first picture on the left-hand side, you see that this was a year one prototype where we fabricated our own pods and grew them under red and blue light. And in this year, we grew them under full spectrum light. We found that these uh, outrageous red romaine lettuce grew better in full spectrum white light. And we also uh, tested our plant growth using these metal cans that you can find at a grocery store and also prefabricated plastic pots. And that made our prototyping process much more streamlined. Mm, I'd like to preface the rest of the presentation by stating that we were actually unable to grow our plants in our systems growth environment. However, we did accomplish um, automation of select components of our design, and we'd like to present that in its place. So some of the key components of the automated design fall mainly into the four workflows, um, and I'd like to detail them here. The first is the camera workflow, which is responsible for taking automated images. The cameras are located at the top and bottom of the module, um, and they're, they should be mounted on a rail system. Um, so the camera system enables the automated picture taking capabilities and partial autom partially automated processing of these images. Next is the irrigation assembly, which is composed of moisture sensors that are attached to the plant pots. Um, and also uh, the moisture assembly is responsible for um, providing, um, providing water to the plants uh, when they are getting dry. Also, we have a temperature regulation system, which is also responsible for um, air circulation. So the temperature regulation system prevents the plants from getting too hot. Lastly is the electronic barrel rotation system, which is responsible for rotating the barrel and allowing ease of access. So here's the electronic uh, barrel rot rotation. So um, as I mentioned before, there's ease of pot insertion and removal, but this also allows for automated growth phase rotation as uh, you might have seen Anthony mention before, every two weeks, um, fully, uh, fully mature heads of lettuce can be harvested from this assembly, although the plants are grown over a four week period. So half the plants are in uh, a different growth phase than the other plants, and therefore um, half of them can be harvested at a time using this uh, barrel rotation assembly. So as part of the irrigation assembly, um, we made some key updates to the pot design so originally in year one, we featured um, three pots on every row. And these pots um, each had some pretty large reservoirs to keep, them, um, to keep them hydrated for a period of about two weeks. So because uh, um, we understood the difficulties of uh, this sort of design uh, and pumping water into each uh, of these uh, 24 pots, I believe, we decided to streamline the pots design by merging each row into one big pot. And this allows us to also make a, a change, which is to shrink the reservoir uh, underneath the plant pots. So combine um, these two changes allow for faster um, and more responsive wicking. Um, so water can be pumped in in response to changes in um, soil moisture sensors more quickly. Um, also, this design uh, as a byproduct allows for more root space. So originally, the water was taking up almost a third of the volume of every plant pot but now it's taking up more about a 10th of the volume. Yeah, so in addition to the updated pot design, we have decided on another ecologically sustainable route for our pots, which will use biodegradable foam that is interchangeable with the current pot system. Foam would provide a lightweight and sustainable alternative for plants to grow in a microgravity environment compared to our previous pot iterations. Yeah, so water is delivered through tubing from the central reservoir to each pot individually. We include capacitive sensors in each pot to measure and allow us to effectively regulate the moisture levels around each plant. And a peristaltic pump moves the water to the pots. The solenoid valves allow us to regulate how much water reaches each plant and to ensure the optimal amount is pumped. Thermistors embedded in the unit measure the temperature throughout and this is used to control the fans and maintain the optimal growing temperature and airflow. 
Finally, we plan on actively monitoring plant health using cameras which surround the central scaffold. In lettuce, hunger signs are expressed through color changes, wilt, and slow growth. So in our design, we monitor color changes in both the visible and infrared spectra and use multi-view geometry to compute the size of each plant. Growth data is stored and processed so that malnutrition and other issues can be diagnosed early. And here is our materials list in case you want to build this yourself. We'd like to acknowledge several of the key, key people on our team um, that were with us last year, as well as the people who have made this competition possible for us. So I'd like to acknowledge Marlon, who was an engineer last year with us, as well as Camden and Kevin, who helped get us funding and organize this team. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge Jacobs Hall, which is the UC Berkeley makerspace. They helped us get uh, prototypes through very quickly, and we're very thankful for this uh, rapid prototyping when we were in person. Lastly, I'd like to thank uh, the GBE contest organizers, as well as uh, you guys. Um, thank you so much for making this presentation and project a reality. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, and I'm sure all our members are also. Please let us know if you have any questions. Very nice job, you guys. It's really cool. And, and your renders are just amazing. I'm really impressed. Um, I, I have a question about uh, the foam you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about the foam that you're thinking of and, and, and for, for growing the plants? Yeah, so uh, previous, previously our, um, our pots were basically like reusable, but since mm -hmm. there's no autoclave on the International Space Station, we decided on a more like com like compostable like alternative, which is like the foam. So um, it wouldn't like ideally be made out of something that would like um, be compostable. It's also like you can, there is like a, a product like online, but we kind of want to mold it into like the shape of like what our pots look like. Mm -hmm. So to like increase our like um, the interchangeability with our like uh, plant growth system. Okay, so it's kind of an open cell type of a squishy foam, but you would you would you would mold that somehow, and then um, the the water and nutrients would be pumped through there or whipped yeah. up from there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I believe the International Space Space Station has like a, a recycling reactor or some something along the lines to like just essentially recycle the nutrients. And I feel like it'd be like a very like useful alternative to like reusability and like yeah, help right sustainability. Yeah, right now we don't, don't have a good way to, to compost things, but we're certainly looking at, you know, ways to compost or react for, for the future. Because um, mm -hmm. getting those nutrients back and, and redoing it. Um, is, is the foam that you're thinking of something that could potentially be manufactured Manufactured in space, or would it have to be sent from Earth? Um, I believe um, there could be like a way to manufacture it, since it's essentially made out of like natural materials and like. Um, but I don't exactly know like the exact like manufacture ma manufacturing like details. But um, I would imagine that you would need to like press it like into like the mold. So mm -hmm. yeah, I believe like it would. You could also like be able to bring it from like Earth and like, just bring it up. So it's yeah. like, it's also very lightweight compared to our previous mediums and substrate. Okay, very cool. Thank you. And, and um, so you said you weren't able to grow plants yet in the prototype. Do you guys have a plan to, to try plants in it or, or what's the, the plan for that? So we have some sort of plan going, we had some sort of plan going forward, but it was sort of uh, smashed by the pandemic. We're yeah. currently spread across three or four states and there are three or four members. So it's gonna be very difficult to continue this project. Although um, the plans um, are gonna change if we do go back in person for fall. Well, let's hope that that's the case. Cause yeah, I, I hope you guys can continue this. It's really good, good work. So thanks so much. Thank you. All right, so, so, so this is Ralph. I have a, a, a comment and a, and a question. Um, yeah, when you said sustainable and, and my, my ears perked up, um, just for clarification perspective, when, when we think of sustainable as a, as a goal for space flight for long duration missions, we're thinking of things we don't necessarily have to send up. I think you increase sustainability by the fact that you can recycle um, nutrients and, and get material out of it and, and continue to close the mass loop. 
but really sustainability is going to be if you could figure out a way to manufacture and reuse that material that the foam in some way shape or form either by using in situ materials or um, some other way as joy was leading to to go ahead and and replenish it with what you have um, the second thing i want to mention is that you did a really good job looking at these different technologies that are of interest to us. I would question, have you thought about cleaning and maintenance of a system like that? It, it would seem to me that it might be a little bit challenging to get in there and perform all the cleaning. And, and that I'm not trying to be nitpicking with you guys. It's just that you thought a lot about uh, technology aspects as it relates to your system. I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to that aspect. Yeah. So as part of our design we tried to make uh, the system as easy to maintain as possible. Um, and that's because uh, like when we merged the pot design and we also uh, organized like the components at the bottom of our assembly, we made it possible and easier to take out and clean the pots um, and also to take out and clean the tubing. I'm not sure of the logistics of cleaning something like that actually aboard the International Space Station, but on Earth, it is, uh, it is a lot easier than what we had in year one for sure. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Hey team, this is Jacob. I would just to make a take a quick second to comment and second what Joya said about the renderings and your CAD drawings. It was very, very awesome. It looked really cool. It illustrates the concepts that you guys are putting together and it's a complex system to put all of these things together, lighting, sensors, irrigation, to grow plants. And then uh, on top of it, you know, what type of media and cleaning and all types of things. One thing uh, that, that I was interested about is you, you did do some plant growth. You grew some lettuce, you, did a, 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 you grew it under different types of lighting and you found a, a result with a different type of spectrum. Uh, what did, that lead to in the end? Is that, did that lead to a particular type of light that you're gonna use for your chamber or, or what was the final determination from that, from that growth? Yeah, I can speak to that. So we found that the full spectrum white light um, resulted in more growth, uh, whereas in the red and blue light that we first used, uh, the plants were predominantly stunted. So moving forward, we will continue using that full spectrum white light. And to the CAD renderings, a shout out to Leonard Way. He's not here, but I'll let him know that he received all these compliments. And I just would add one last comment that I would love to see uh, you guys get back together and grow some plants in your chamber. I think that would just be awesome, especially the 45 degree turning uh, mechanism. I think that's that's unique. And I'd, I'd like to see that, that grow. And it's also good to see you here, Anthony Tan. Uh, it's good to see you in person, sir. Great, thanks. Uh, all right, looks like we're on to our next team. Let me uh, remove the current one. And the next team up is Simon which includes Sarah Humphrey, Emmerich Larkin, Stefan Lanton, Sean Romero, Jacob Mass, J Jacob York, and Oren Anderson. All right, so we have Sarah and Jacob, you're on the panelists. Uh, so you can share your, your video and your audio and your screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, sorry, technical difficulties here. I have never been made a panelist before, so I'm figuring this out. All right. No worries. <laughs> Thank you for your patience here. All 
Okay, I'm going to share my screen, but I do not see a, okay, wait, there it is. There we go. It's sharing now, can you see? Yes. Perfect, thank you. I wanna preface this by saying that our design is very similar to the seed shuttles, um, just the layout of our design. But in this presentation, I go into a little bit more of the details of how it's a little bit different and then how the layout is a little bit different. And then we talk in depth about the other elements of our design, like the automation and the controls. So here it is. We're not getting any audio, Sarah, if you don't, if it has audio. Yes, it does have audio. Okay, um, so when you click share screen, there's a little checkbox at the bottom that says share computer sound. Okay. Yeah, there, there might be a, if you're playing a video. All right. Um, share screen, optimize for video clip, perfect. Thanks for the help there. All right, here I am playing it. Please let me know if you don't hear the sound. Will do. Hi, my name is Sarah Humphrey, and today my team is presenting Simon, the Spacefaring Intelligent Modular Nursery. Simon is based on the Seed Shuttle design and is optimized with camera access, Raspberry Pi integration, sensor placement, and almost total control over the growing environment. For automation reasons, we allocated different subsystems into the four corners of our chamber bars with pumps and sensors. One corner has microcontrollers and storage for other hardware. One corner has the imaging system and uh, the irrigation system inside of that central column is completely removable and adjustable based on whether Simon is in gravity, microgravity, or partial gravity on the moon or Mars. We use reusable, cleanable material, but it's important to note that this irrigation system is also very easy to modify and exchange for each crop. For more details on our system design, please visit us at the Growing Beyond Earth Maker contest page and look for Simon. Now, the most important part of our design is the control system. Control system for Simon is fundamentally based on PID controllers at the set point maintenance level. We're also considering implementing a gain scheduled PI controller to better overcome the non-linearity of some of the control actions such as pH adjustment. We use a suite of environmental sensors as inputs into the existing PID algorithms and actuators, including stepper motors, fans, lights, peristaltic pumps, and others that respond to these PID outputs. The Simon analytical platform, which is capable of tracking plant health, will assist in re-optimizing these set points for new envi environments and form the basis of an outer control loop. This creates a control system framework that continuously creates metadata associated with the health and phenotypic phenotypic information of our plants. And this data can be used to validate and improve our biological models and assess the general performance of the system. Biological models can be used to identify ways to improve the growing situation of the plants from a place of mechanistic understanding as time progresses. But those growing data sets can also be fed to machine learning based frameworks to optimize desired outcomes further, improving how the system operates over time and space. To track plant health, Simon has an imaging system consisting of two Raspberry Pi camera modules modified with autofocus capabilities. One camera is fitted with an infrared filter and the other is not in order to produce two images for a total of six wave bands. Pixel data from these images then undergoes a homography transform in order to correct for parallax error and a radiometric calibration step to ensure that the wave band values are standardized between images. Using these data, Simon can automatically calculate vegetation index calculations requiring infrared bands, such as the normalized difference vegetation index, which is a coarse way of evaluating overall plant health. An additional step we are currently implementing is to correlate the values of six wave bands with ground truth phytochemistry to produce standard multispectral responses. Then, when Simon takes images of plants, it can automatically compare up-to-date Im images with known responses to common stressors, such as tip burn and drought stress, and provide corrective action by changing set points within its control system. We envision the Simon in its final form having a fully realized graphical user interface to facilitate use. 
While the Simon itself is autonomous, this GUI will allow astronauts to see all details related to the Simon's operations at any time. This will allow astronauts to monitor progress and handle issues as needed. Here we have a few pages of our interactive, interactable wireframe, which will allow astronauts access to photos, sensor readings, and all of the data the Simon is measuring. At every control step, the observed step will be displayed on the GUI. We programmed our interface to be able to take in data from our sensors and update live graphs, as well as receive photos from the imaging system. To build a prototype of our assignment, we used US new prototyping laboratory. Um, it took us nine months of Intel co design before we even began to build and multiple physical iterations once we did. Um, along the way, we did many things to improve the design, like retrofitting our aquaponics system and uh, redoing our lighting system. Um, unfortunately, because members of our team are away, um, we have people across the globe right now, we could not um, finish the prototype and grow within the 28 day period. So we chose to stress test the Simon instead. Uh, stress testing is important because in a real world scenario, you don't know what will happen. It's important to have a robust system response. Um, to do this, we will check the um, gain system and controls to various different disturbances like pH swings and power failures. Um, alongside stress testing, we also use modeling to predict our potential yields, which Stephen will talk to you about now. Thanks, Jay. One of the core functions of Simon is its modeling capability. As a method of predicting yield, we reproduce the modified energy cascade model as developed by Jones and Cavazzoni and parameterized for lettuce and other crops by Volk, Monhe, and Bugby. By inputting the growth period, the photo period, ambient CO2 concentration, and light intensity for each day, we can produce a time series of the expected dry matter that our lettuce would produce. Here, you can see the expected growth for a system with Simon's environmental conditions. By having the model take in measured values, Simon can recalculate the expected yield every day in a digital twin fashion to give the most up-to-date information on a grow. In conclusion, we have modeled our expected plant growth, which allows us to predict the most likely yields from Simon. We will continue stress testing and tweaking other aspects of our control system, and we will compare our final yields to those predicted by our model. Listed here are the changes we envision both as we continue to work on the assignment ourselves as well as future research is performed. Overall, as we've explained, all of our research and design choices have gone towards maintaining a system that is efficient in all respects, has potential for modularity in other systems with designs, and maintains a highly controlled environment. By following these future goals, we hope to bring our automated assignment to fruition. Special thanks to the contest organizers and to our team's many wonderful mentors. You can see our project at the link below that I will post in the chat, and you can reach out to us at the emails that I also send in the chat. Thank you for your time. So I, I do want to elaborate a little bit. Um, so alongside the mathematical modeling and the stress testing, we also did grow plants. We just didn't grow them in the Simon itself. We only, you know, after building and finally, you know, getting so close to finishing our system, we realized we didn't quite have enough time to grow plants the full 28 days. And so we did the stress testing and we did the mathematical modeling, um, but we also did grow plants separately um, with the same rock wool media that we were planning to put into Simon. Um, of course, in Simon, we also use a zip grow type media as well, um, but we tested the rock wool and we tested the uh, similar lights as are in Simon now. Um, so we did grow plants separately and it did work out in that rock wool and under those lights, um, but we did not, just to clarify, did not grow them inside of Simon. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Sarah and, and Jacob, and you know, thank the rest of the team. I mean, that was a really wonderful presentation. Um, and obviously, you guys have, have done a lot. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, real expertise and thought put into this, which is really very apparent. And it, it's really, really impressive. Um, I, I guess, could you elaborate a little bit on the stress testing that you're doing with the system? I'm curious to, to know kind of what parameters you're testing and how you're stressing it. Right. Um, so I actually don't see Emmerich Larkin put on this this panelist uh, list. So if someone could please do that, that would be helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, we have been 
mostly focused on stress testing our irrigation system, um, specifically the pH and uh, the nutrients, making sure, um, you know, if the pH gets way out of whack, we're able to correct for that. Um, so that's been most of our focus right now, because as we moved forward with this project, we realized that the irrigation system is if something goes wrong in that system, it's the fastest way for our plants to just all die off. Um, and so that was where most of our focus was um, on stress testing. Emmerich, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, most of the stress testing that I'm performing right now is um, adapting the PID controls from large hydroponic tanks that we have in our main research growth chambers to the very small volumes uh, in comparison in our um, storage tanks and nutrient tanks in the Simon unit. Um, and it takes, you know, some some tuning. So before the stress testing takes place, I'm making sure that the PID constants are correct and chosen appropriately for the different volumes and the different um, concentrations of our stock pH adjustment in nutrient solutions. Um, but we're also, uh, sorry, hold on, my laptop is running out of battery here. <laughs> Uh, we're also uh, uh, intentionally disturbing the pH uh, once those uh, KI and, and um, the other PID values are chosen and um, also mimicking drift as well and um, doing things like uh, overheating the chamber and seeing how our ventilation responds to that. Just basically intentionally perturbing all of the parameters that we have under control um, both within the um, kind of expected range that we would expect plant expect plants or maybe bacteria in the solution to perturb the system, but also um, in extreme scenarios where outside factors um, cause disturbances in the system, like power failures or the chamber outside of the system heating up, those kinds of things. That sounds really, really good. So. Um, Another question on the modeling. I thought that was a really unique aspect of this, the fact that you integrated these models and, and, and the fact that you could adapt them given you know, data that say you're harvesting and you input those data. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that? I, I'm assuming that the plant growth is somewhat staggered. Is that true? And, and like, does the model take that into account or, or is, is, are, would all the plants be maturing at one time? Stephen can talk more about the modeling specifics on the higher level, but each tube is intended to have uh, plants all of the same development stage. The tubes can be stacked on top of each other um, in a modular fashion. So you could maybe take advantage of the same internal rotation um, and nutrient solution, but there could be a barrier between them if you wanted to separate, I don't know, something like gas exchange. Yeah, the plan was to do modeling. Um, the plan has been to do modeling uh, for plants of all the same growth stage and for us to later look into ways that that, um, like Emmerich said, can be can be optimized for efficiency. Cool. Thank you. So I'm going to ask the same question I asked the previous group. Um, have you given thought into cleanliness for you know, cleaning it between cycles. And, and if you can talk a little bit about that, if you have, please. Yeah, so the central column, um, if, if you can picture the central column, can actually be pulled out completely um, and can be cleaned um, you know, separately if, if that's what you want to do with you know, astronauts and crew members. However, um, we're looking into ways that the system can clean itself. Uh, something that wasn't really included in this presentation uh, that we would like to continue to improve upon is this rail system that we have along the same corner that those cameras are in. And so this rail system could hold cameras and, you know, move up and down along the chamber to, you know, take pictures of all of the plants. Um, or it can be outfitted with technology to do things like sowing seeds and like harvesting. And so one other option for how we can further improve this rail system that we're developing is by adding um, 
robotics and adding technologies that would enable it to clean the system. So if it had some sort of sprayer, you know, it, it can move along the chamber um, and may be able to spray around the chamber as well. So we're working on that and we're considering it. It's definitely um, one of our main considerations, but in this phase of the competition, our main focus has been growing the lettuce. And it's um, interesting another... oh, let me just jump in real quick. The last time you guys presented, you focused a little bit more and talked a little bit more about that rail system and how you package things. And I thought that was a very compelling aspect of your project because you made it easier potentially for access to those areas. So, so don't undersell that when you're talking about it. Rick, were you going to say something? I need to cut you. Uh, Jacob was going to say something, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, uh, oh no, sorry, me, Jacob. Go ahead, Jacob. Um, apologies for the lack of video, but um, we were actually, this is definitely a, a future um, movement out of this realm of this competition, but for like proposed implementation, we'd like to incorporate some kind of biologic control on the microbe scale um, with the idea being that, you know, in order to prevent um, harmful growth of, of competitive algae or competitive bacteria or fungi, we'll have our own engineered um, and benign um, bacteria or organ microorganism um, out competing that. And so as a way to keep it clean, we'll essentially just use up all nutrients that aren't being used by the system. Or at least that's one theory we're moving towards in like um, biologic control, a synthetic biology approach. Just another thing I'd wanted to, to highlight was um, we actually, so on the topic of how you clean the system, we put a lot of thought into what even type of hydroponic system we would use in the system itself. Um, and then probably one of the main factors deciding was how we could clean this and how we could actually clean the tubes and what gunk would build up for what. That's why we didn't go with um, aeroponics, for example, which we were considering for a while. But a uh, part that I think um, that I, I think is great about our system is the modularity, which as Sarah said, the middle column can be taken out and actually um, you could put in different, um, different modules that are tailored to different environments. For example, microgravity versus maybe limited gravity on Mars potentially, right? And so we think um, theoretically you could have different systems in there that would be cleaned differently and removable in different ways. And we, and we wanted to, to allow future, you know, flexibility for our system in that way. Yeah, that's a great point. The The media that's actually in there and that can be exchanged is cleanable. Um, and that was a really big factor in our decision for grow, for choosing a zip grow type media. Any other questions? This is Jacob. I just want to say very quick that this is excellent work, very diverse. Um, I think that the there's so many things that I can cover and just say that it's really awesome. But one of the biggest things that I saw that has potential, um, and I think you kind of led to it already, Jacob and Sarah, was um, the predictive plant modeling. Um, the work that you did here could be applied to later work, like maybe using that as a reference to identify plant health, you know, and, and incorporating that to control your systems to deliver a certain amount of nutrients because this plant isn't growing as well as the predictive model says it should, or, or things like that. So I, I just see so many uh, potential technologies that you guys have presented today and just wonderful job. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, and I wish Stephen was here to talk on that too, because the, the imaging system really is, is crucial in, in that as well. Um, and additionally, as the imaging system gets more data in, uh, it can kind of reference um, the data that we have grown and, and you know get a better understanding of how to detect the plant's health. Maybe in the future, even have some deep learning encoded in that, I don't know. But yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of potential future ways to go with that, super exciting. Thank you again awesome. so much. Great job, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that was the last of the collegiate finalists. We're moving on to our professional finalists. And the first one up is Jeff and Megan Hughes. 
Let's see if I can find them in the. There it is. All right. Hello, my name is Megan. Um, my name is Megan Hughes. I okay. We're waiting for Jeff Hughes to show up. Hi there. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, sorry. If you can, um, Megan, turn off your audio, sweetie. She's in a different spot from me. So that we can both we can both do this. Hi there. Hit me, sweetie. <laughs> Thanks. We'll try again. We're Team Astronaut Microgreens from the Growing Beyond Earth Maker Challenge. I'm Megan Hughes and I'm seven years old. And I'm Jeff Hughes, Megan's dad. Megan, all of six at the time, came up with an idea that allows for the production of more than a ton of vegetables per year out of a 50 centimeter cube with only a two and a half inch stack of materials that weigh less than eight pounds. Just add water and electricity. I called it the Mega Method, a sponge diffused osmosis variation of the Cracky Method. Managing more than a ton of crops in a 50 centimeter cube can get complicated fast. Nominal values based on rounded numbers are used for simplicity. The system will need to be scaled to less than 100% to get everything to fit plus a margin of error. We are also going to assume a homogeneous crop to demonstrate this initial idea, which isn't what we would do in space, it just makes the example simpler. In addition to the items listed here, we focused on maximizing metabolizable nutrient output. According to the NIH, just days after germination, a plant the size of a four-leaf clover can have more nutrients, vitamins, and minerals than a head of broccoli. So based on that, the real KPI that we realized we needed to chase was plant count, not input-output mass ratios. When we stopped trying to chase I.O., we were able to dial in a 6x increase in mass output over our original estimates by modulating seed density. Microgreens are young vegetables. They are nutrient-rich and grow densely, and they are fun to watch grow. A 10 centimeter coconut core pad of tetsoy seeds will grow 12.5 millimeters and yield 150 grams in five days. Microgreens are a one touch crop. Seeds placed on a reusable pad only need water, light, and air to grow. Put them in a perforated mylar bag. Leave them alone, then pull them out and eat them. Coconut core is hardy. It gives the roots something to grab onto. Sponge is lighter. Compresses for travel and holds more water, but it's fragile. We use the sponge to supply contained water to the core. The capillary action from the core wicks water from the absorbent sponge. Put it all in a mylar bag with an LED strip on top. We can take advantage of microgravity and stack the pad. Pigs don't take up that much space for a couple of days. We put a new pad on the bottom of the stack every day. When day-over-day day growth declines, we harvest from the top. On day 10, we have a stack of 10 pads that are 25 centimeters tall. We have 50 centimeters to work with in every direction, so we can have two 25 centimeter tall stacks. The pads are 10 centimeters square, so we can pack them five wide and five deep for a total of 500 pads. We can harvest 100 pads a day if we only let the pads grow for five days. We were able to consistently achieve 150 grams per pad of growth. Each day we can harvest those 100 pads from the top. 100 times 150 equals 15,000, or six tons per year of output. To be clear, we have not run this experiment for a full year. These numbers are extrapolated. Astronauts get their choice of vegetables every meal. For six astronauts, the system could produce up to 30% of their recommended daily calories. 500 pads is a lot to manage, so we'll put 5 pads in a bag, and then just manage 100 bags. 
There is no storage required. Astronauts eat the microgreens right off the pad, then clean and return the pads for continuous production. Astronaut microgreens is a just add water kit with everything you need to learn about microgreens and general plant growth that would be for sale in science-oriented gift shops around the world next to astronaut ice cream. It would contain seeds, core, sponge, a mylar bag, LEDs, a tray, and astronaut salad dressing. Minimum electronics for the system consist of the LEDs and the wire to supply them electricity connected to a timer that's on for 18 hours and off for six, inclusively weighing around 205 grams. Materials for the 100 bags weigh less than 3.5 kilograms and are 2.5 inches for transport. Thank you very much for watching. This has been a lot of fun. I hope you guys were able to, to see the video there. I was a little blind to it all. <clears throat> and Ralph, I built you a pad dishwasher. So I'll preempt that question right out of the box and uh, show you, you know, show you that if you like me to. I, I can't wait to get it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, if you, it's omni-gravitational too. I wasn't quite ready to talk about this. We talked about, um, uh, how we would do this in, in the next version, but uh, just with the vacuum and pumping water in and out of a, of a bag I, I, um, and, a, and a grid, I think that we can clean them that way. We also experimented with a stainless steel uh, pad, which worked as well. Um, but anyway, I'll answer your, your questions directly. Hi, this is Amy. I actually have a question for Megan. So in the beginning, you said that this was Megan's idea. So Megan, how did you come up with this idea? I just thought it would work. Do you grow a lot of plants at home? Do you know a lot about growing plants? Yes. All right. Well, it's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, we had an ideation session where uh, uh, she threw out a lot of very interesting ideas, including the astronaut uh, salad dressing. And um, I think the original, like, well, it, it's it's a, a wet sponge in a microwave popcorn bag is the is the actual, you know, origin of the idea. Yeah, I love the simplicity of it. And I love all of the, the system analysis that you guys did to, to kind of figure out what it could look like. Um, I guess one thing I'm a little curious about is, you know, the, the, the airflow and the thermal movement, because you said there were LED lights, yeah. um, you know, without without fans you don't have any natural convection in microgravity so if you could talk a little about that that'd be great yep so uh we created a single this we talked about this in the first round but not in this one due to time constraints uh we created a mylar bag uh, a single seam mylar bag with a a twisted up piece of plastic inside right that would expand in space and then a fan with a little uh, bernoulli input on it uh that takes care of airflow which is one of these 500 slides in here, which I will point out to you as soon as I can find it right there. So uh, a Bernoulli bag effect on a fan with a mylar vent. And and so would these oh, hook, hook together the or? Um, Sorry, can you oh. see, uh, maybe you can't see the screen that yeah. I'm sharing. Still Was seeing the it? video. There we go. I'm there we so go. sorry. Yep. Yeah, because of the, the overlapping of the, uh, uh, of the panel. So yeah, uh, um, yeah, we did think about ventilation and uh, I think it doesn't really add very much to the, the, the total weight of the system. Uh, just that piece of mylar and then a, a 0.1 millimeter piece of, in this case, clear uh, plastic that you spiral up and, and stick inside. And then we had a little uh, a fan that was just running the whole time. That's really cool. That's very similar to an approach that folks were looking at for water disinfection in space. It was a spiral uh, UV disinfection system, a spiral UV lamp, um, and then the water would flow around that. So you would get, you know, all surfaces um, basically treated. So it's a similar, a similar approach. Um, 
in terms of that, would that also be what would be removing your heat from your LEDs or would that be removed separately? It does, um, yes. I, you know, I obviously, uh, it's very difficult for me to experiment in a, a low gravity environment and I have sure. no idea what the lack of convection uh, will really do. Uh, we'll have to figure that out. Um, but, you know, these things, plants are hardier than than we think, I, you know, than, you know, I, I, uh, I was expecting they they were tough, and uh, you know even stacking these things you know right on top of each other in earth gravity, uh, they were still growing you know the way that we wanted and so forth. That wasn't the way we ran the full experiment, uh, but we were packing them uh, very densely towards the end, and they didn't really care being stacked five levels tall at all. Very cool. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, we also experimented with you know, like I said the stainless steel pads, which I had up first, but you couldn't see it. Um, so a sponge, and if we put uh, a stainless steel mesh, that worked fairly well in exchange for the uh, the coconut core pad. Although that's not how we ran the whole experiment. We ran it with coconut core. Yeah, I have a quick question for Megan. Miss Megan, what is your favorite microgreen? Which microgreen would you start testing with if it's up to you? Arugula. She likes arugula. arugula. What's your favorite microgreen? Do you like them all? No. All of them. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you like the mustard one? Is the mustard one good too? Yeah, the mustard's good. Sorry, we're shy now. <laughs> oh, Megan, it's such a good idea. I think it's so fun. I can't wait to see the rest of the projects that you have in your mind for the future. I, and I think it's a good demonstration of, um, especially your calculations that you showed how much you can produce in that area. I, I think that that's just a really uh, valuable idea. Uh, in, in, um, and I think you're showing us here how you would clean your system and reset. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that, that you would have to consider with your system. And it's good to see that you're already thinking about it and working on it and stuff. But uh, wonderful job. Thank you for presenting and sharing with us. And, and so let me just jump in and say, one of the things that I, I really appreciated about this idea is that, you know, maybe this is just too common an expression, but it's kind of like a disruptive technology in regards to crop production and trying to feed crews. Um, we tend to focus on what have been developed over time to be more, for lack of a better term, traditional crop growth approaches. And, and most all the concepts you see are going to be some adaptation of that type of philosophy. This is the kind of thing that if we got into a pinch, whether that was in terms of being able to develop the hardware in time, um, if, if mass and volume constraints were so significant that we couldn't deploy a, a larger system uh, of the kind we've seen previously, that would provide an, a, an alternative approach perhaps to at least meet the nutritional requirements that would be beneficial for crew health. So, so things like this um, are ideas that I think keep everybody thinking and, and, and honest in their in, in their pursuit of trying to come up with uh, candidate solutions that will, you know, maybe not be traditional, but which will meet the requirements that we're really being asked to meet. Um, so in that regard, I, I would love to see this continue, and, and I'd love to see. Um, you know, even from the NASA side, more thought put into these type of ideas, um, because the day may come where we're asked to deploy some system on a future vehicle, and just due to budgetary constraints, time constraints, et cetera, we won't be able to necessarily answer all these complex technical issues with the more, let's say, advanced systems. Um, and if we can't do that, then we would have nothing if we don't have some of these more simple basic systems that we could fall back on. Um, the alternative is if, if things like this work real well, then um, maybe there's no reason to do those other ones, but uh, we'll, I'll defer that till later. <laughs> well, you could fly one pad, right? And it could be five grams, right? A very small, just little sample of this thing and, and off you go. Or one uh, bag of uh, 10 pads, that would be 40 grams. 
And you know, yeah, we, and I don't, you know, think, I don't think you would you have a mass or volume penalty at all in this. I I, I would I guess we'd have to look at the you know we, we talk about microgreens and and seeds. So so flying the seeds and the longevity of the seeds is something we have to validate regardless. Um, the other thing is that we wind up limiting ourselves to just microgreens, um, but that isn't necessarily you know, a bad thing in, in, in certain applications because there's such a variety and different flavors and they're highly nutritious. So um, I think we in NASA really know, need to run this to ground. And I know that we have uh, funded opportunities for the near future to investigate microgreens in more detail. So um, we'll see how it plays out. Um, get going on seed consistency right away. You'll probably have to grow your own seeds. The seeds that we got from True Leaf and Johnny Seeds and so forth uh, were not consistent or homogenous. Uh, so we were filtering and uh, and sorting and sieving these things, you know, quite a bit. The other thing is you don't, they don't need to go on the pad until, you know, they start sprouting, right? So you get two days back with all of that. And then if you sieve for the lightest ones and make sure you get high germinators, uh, you can get really great, IOs. We were chasing IO at the, at the at the start of this thing, but it was silly because Veggie kicked our butt on IO by three orders of magnitude. Uh, the only you know time makes IO whatever number you want it to be. Um, plant count is what we kind of ended up with as our uh, KPI, uh, and then you know we got to that six tons per year uh, yield. Well, I just really appreciate all the work that you guys did and, and all the thought and I'm, I'm looking, you know, your slides now, there's just so much great information in there. So thank you both for, for, for all your hard work on this. And I, I hope to see it continue and I hope we get to, to test it. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you very much. Awesome job. All right, so next up we have the Harvest Drawers team, Carl Wagner and Danielle. If you can raise your, click the raise hand button. Hey everyone. Hi. Oh, ran through the presentation backwards. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Perfect. Uh, so we're team harvesters out of Duluth, Minnesota. And on team, uh, there's me, Carl, and also Danielle, who is good for UX, web design, and general gardening. And I have a background in some aerospace and also mathematics. Ah, so we started out with just a general hydroponics type design and went with three individual shelves. And this allowed us to have, um, with the three shelves, either stagger it or grow all at one time. So we could have shorter grower heights on different trays, going larger for once the plants mature, or just in one bulk growth session, which we did for the contest. And like a lot of other teams, we use a Raspberry Pi and we were going to set up everything with Adafruit IO and so on, but a lot of our extra sensors and so on were cut just due to time constraints. And our materials, uh, we used the 2020 aluminum extrusion for the frame system. Uh, LED lights, we use 70, 20 LEDs with aluminum backing um, just off of Amazon and those seem to work pretty well.
So here's the beginning of our design slash build. Uh, so we put the LED strips backed on to just galvanized aluminum, which build out the trays in the top part of the cover, which doubled as a heat sink. The uh, drawer slides are just typical cabinet drawer slides that we're able to click in and click out for ease of access to all the plants. And we side mounted a bunch of computer PC fans just to help with cooling and increase airflow around the plants. So the results from it uh, were pretty good this year uh, compared to last year. We had, I think, more than double the production of our system last year with some modifications to it. We used, uh, we ended up increasing our computer power supply to a larger 700 watt one just to ease the burden on it for all the lighting system. Um, so down, let's see, can you still see the cursor, mouse cursor? So here's just kind of our power distribution. So we had five volts and 12 volts coming out of here, another 12 volt power rail to power the lighting system and other uh, relays and so on. Um, up here, we have the Raspberry Pi along with uh, eight bank relays, which controlled lighting on the first few. Um, then we had our water pump down here for all the different trays. Um, air pump, which was controlled by its own individual relay. And then um, the nutrient pump. And here's a little bit of a look on the inside with the wiring. So each under each tray, we had, I think, five or six rows of LEDs. Uh, we had some additional ones set up ready to go, but we ended up not needing them. And then to each tray, we have um, a line for air hose. So we're able to send an air bubbler into each watering tray to add a little more oxygen and also to aid in mixing of the nutrients when they were delivered to each tray. So we ran that for one minute every five minutes just to kind of mix around the water a little bit, add some air and so on. The blue line was for our water to each tray. And then there's also a data or a sensor cable just for a float water sensor. We tried, we used the capacitive ones last year, but those kept corroding and failing. So we just went with the simplest sensor we could to get that data that we needed. Um, for our grow plugs, this is after the harvest. We use the AeroGuard and foam plugs. They're uh, relatively cheap and their germination rates were very good from when we did testing. Last year we had used a aquarium foam that had good German or didn't have great germination times, but it would grow well after. So, but we that would take up to seven days for plants to germinate, whereas the AeroGuard and foam plugs were able to get consistently within three days having sprouts which we couldn't be to figure out a different way so went with the most reliable starting system and that allowed the plants to go from germination to full plant growth in the same plug uh, this is uh, where the water sensor is located uh, back here is for the water inlet and then the clear hose is the air inlet and this is a quick look at what the roots look like after. So that's after the full 28 days. And we're able to just kind of lift up the front of the lids, kind of like almost like on a hinge and kind of check underneath. Uh, in the middle, you can see we just use our aquarium air stone to make micro bubbles or make small air bubbles for aeration. Uh, and then back a little bit more. So for our watering system, we just had a water line going down to a water reservoir. Um, our system ended up using about 17 gallons of water total for the 28 day period. So each tray holds one gallon of water about and 
every day was about half to a full gallon of water that it was using. The top two trays, there was a little bit of a gap between the tray top and the outside air. So we noticed that the top tray was sucking up a lot more water than our bottom tray, which was better sealed. So just evaporation, we were losing quite a bit of water that way. Uh, we also used AeroGuard and plant food, which we put in eight milliliters of plant nutrient every two weeks to each tray. So each tray was only 16 milliliters of plant food total. And this one reservoir should last over a year, possibly a year and a half of time, just off that one uh, jug. Uh, and we had that pumped in directly into our water system. So our blue water line would bring in, send up to this little area, would pump into this little area, and then send it out to each individual tray through the solenoid valves up here. So we'd only pop, turn on one solenoid at a time and kind of send it through the lines that way, and then run some clean water after that, just to clear out everything again. And then we we're able to get, I believe this is full growth for the red lettuce variety, which we were really excited about because we'd never got that previously in the 28 day period. And the harvest was surprisingly a, a lot of lettuce. Uh, I think it was close to, two, it was two, about 2.4 pounds or 1,086 grams of lettuce. So it was a full grocery bag of lettuce after this harvest, which was kind of fun to see. And compared to our previous year, it the lettuce was definitely more plentiful, which I think theoretically it was around half a kilogram, but I think our actual results last year were about 300 grams of lettuce produced. Huh? Any questions? This is very impressive, Carl. The, the lettuce plants look great. Um, I don't know how you ate all of that, but <laughs> give lettuce to all your neighbors. Yeah, um, uh, some of them went to chickens even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I like how you said at the beginning that you could do it as a staggered uh, harvest because, you know, that would be probably way too much um, lettuce for spacefarers at a given time. But if you had you know, each tray at kind of a different growth stage, then you would always be able to have some, and that could be a really effective way. Uh, um, I was wondering about, you know, it looks like your sides, your front, everything's kind of an open frame. Is yep. this is this required for the system or, or, or not? Um, so last year we went for the more closed system, which mm -hmm. uh, seemed to work also. This year we kind of just went open frame just to make everything easier. Um, I think it could easily be closed out by kind of ducting the airflow from the sides um, through the top and bottom of the trays. So I think probably for a year three, we'll go to the fully enclosed type of design and try to make it so that the electronic systems are able to be accessed from the front side also. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it makes sense for for if you're trying to use less water and, and be able to, to recycle your water, you can raise that internal humidity and, and um, then you don't transpire. And maybe there's a way to even recover the, the transpiration water so that you're not, because, you know, 17 gallons of water, it's a lot, but obviously the spacecraft would be recovering a lot of that water that's evaporating off or transpiring off. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be closed. I, I just just was curious about thermal, you know, controls and things for that. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess one comment is that the bubbler approach works obviously great on the ground. I'm not sure how well that would work in microgravity. It would probably okay. work in, in reduced gravity, something like Martian gravity. But in microgravity, if you tried to do that, I think you just get like one giant bubble forming around oh, no. the bubbler stone because water and air don't mix well. And that's been a big challenge. 
Um, so you might have to think of something like more of like a, a porous plate inside there that, that the, the roots could grow along um, so they could still get that air. Um, okay. So so you may, you know, a, a tray of water with, with a bubbler, it, it works great on earth, but that's one of the problems where, where, where bubbles can actually form and they can clog um, clog lines because they just don't move and then they just accrete and then they'll pop together into one giant bubble. So, so that would be one thing to think about for the future. But okay, no, cool. I really like it. And I mean, obviously, obviously it grows really well. So congratulations. I like your nutrient injection approach. I think that's really good. Um, and, you know, I've, not everything is reusable, with the arrow garden plugs and things, but you're keeping those components really light. So that's great. Yeah, I'm excited to maybe try it out that uh, stainless steel mesh because I'd like to get away from the arrow garden plugs, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that could be that could be fun. Something that, you know, because finding things that are reusable and cleanable, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. But if it's also something that could be made on orbit, maybe something 3D printed, or um, if, if it could be, you know, broken down and then re re conjugated or, or something there might be other approaches there too so cool yeah excited to investigate those for next year great thanks hey carl this is jacob um i, I have to make a few comments I, I think that this is just an amazing compact system and it's wonderful to see that you actually grew plants in there and you had such great results. I think it's so wonderful. I, I can comment and talk about so many things. I think that um, the way that you compacted and organized your hardware is a great accomplishment. I, I can see how everything is organized. I think that's really great. I can envision myself working with this system, pulling a drawer out, having access to see the plants and looking at them push the drawer back in and go down to the next one. I, I think that that is a great way to, to go about growing crops. Um, I, one of my comments, one of my comments is, or like something that I can see is maybe growing multiple crops in, in each drawer or in a different section. And I guess one thing that, that maybe you can consider, or maybe I can ask if you have considered um, making adjustable uh, shelf height so you can accommodate for different crops and stuff like that. Have you thought about doing anything like that or, or uh, do you think it's possible? Yeah, I was dreaming about that, trying to make it so that it would be um, like on a screw so it could raise and lower each drawer, but I couldn't figure out a good way to make each one change individually because I was thinking then you would need to have like a servo or stepper or something like on each tray to like go up and down the rods or something. Yeah. And then the equipment to go up and down with yeah. it is a challenge. Um, what do you what do you account for your change in your improvement in, in plant growth from your original version to this one? What do you think happened that 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 made you have such great growth during this trial? Um, I think it was really using the like Canadian moss as the grow plugs, since it cut down our germination time by a full week, and I think that made a huge difference just right off the get go to getting the plants going and growing well. Um, so I think that was probably the largest contributing factor. Um, and then also maybe sealing out the tops also of the gro each grow tray, because before we had a black foam where the plants would grow out of, but we also had lots of algae buildup in that system, which could have been also starving the system of oxygen possibly. So I think it was mostly just the grow environment for the seeds is, was our biggest change. And then Excellent we just, growth. yeah. And then we switched to our own custom control system for everything this year, which I don't think necessarily aided in the growth of the plants, but definitely allows for future expansion and more custom ability. Were you using an off the shelf one previously? Yep. Yeah, yeah all right, cool. So you evolved to making your own to address the needs that you were seeing essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. I, I think it's a great technology. Good job. Oh, thank you. So um, let me jump in 
and, and I've got a couple of comments that that uh, hopefully will challenge you in a way. Um, so yeah, you've definitely demonstrated volume optimization, but in, in doing it in this approach, and this kind of relates a little to what Jacob said, you're really limiting the, the, the canopy height of the crops you grow. Um, so mm -hmm. to grow alternative crops, or you would have to, you, you know, your volume, the quantity of crops you're gonna grow at any one time would go down. Um, it also seems to be a system that's very much dependent on crew interaction, uh, just because it doesn't seem like you have the ability to monitor plant health with any type of imaging technology, especially as the plants grow, it's going to be the crew sliding out drawers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's going to that's going to prevent uh, you know early detection of issues. And so in an operational scenario, when crew time is is really uh, precious, if it, this was a surface-based system, let's say, and the astronauts have very little time that would potentially be problematic because when they had an opportunity to slide a drawer out, they're gonna find something maybe that they don't like. Um, and then, you know, just the, the way you're actually growing the plants appears to be very analogous to a terrestrial hydroponic setup. You know, you've, and so I'm only saying these things because, you know, you've demonstrated good plant growth, but there's nothing novel in the approach that you're really using that would, you know, you should be, especially mm -hmm. if it's an open system like that. So I would say going forward, I think you're going to have to, you know, address some of those ideas so that this doesn't just look to be a neat way of packaging a terrestrial system, if you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah. And and not meant to be negative, but you're in the professional class. And, and if you're going to have legs on this thing, you know, I want you to at least, you know, look at how you could potentially replace some of the non-sustainable things or the things I've addressed in such a way as to improve it in a space flight application. I, I think as, as Joy has said, for partial gravity systems, something where the crew is definitely engaged in an activity like this, um, the volume optimization is great. There's no no question about that. But the the odds of having a system that's open on all sides like that um, mm -hmm. would probably be somewhat um, minimal. <laughs> um, and then you know other things to think about, and just to consider for future if, if you're going to you know plan to go you know further with it is modularity of systems i see a lot of the the components on the back side so if if that was actually up against the back of a a structure and you had some type of failure to work with so you, mm -hmm. you want to think about you know operational aspects is all i'm really getting at think of it from a variety of different ways and 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 come up with potential ideas as to how you could make it um you know more flexible in that regard mm -hmm. okay Thank yeah, you. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks for all the comments. All right. Well, thanks so much, Carl. All right. Last but not least, we have uh, Team Miami, Jack Hahn, Alan Beal, and Nick Brunk. Hi, can you all hear me? Okay, uh, thanks for, for having us here. Uh, I'm gonna play a quick video that Jack put together. Let me know if there's any problem with the audio. Uh, share sound, optimize for video. I would like to introduce our team that has come together to address the challenges and develop creative solutions to growing plants in space, Jack Hahn, Nick Brunk, and Alan Deal. The primary focus of this project is to test the functionality of the physical space, the movable individual root chambers, and the fluid delivery system to see if the plants will actually grow and to what mass. The ability to move the plants as they grow allows them to move to increasingly larger growing areas within a cube of 50 centimeter dimensions. This allows for the maximum utilization of the available growing space 
and thus maximize the biomass that is produced over a defined period of time. Using a microcontroller-based project development board with analog and digital input and outputs, time periods for grow lights, nutrient solution flow, and on states for fans were managed. Basic mathematical operators and conditional logic were programmed with C++ into the Arduino Uno. Exact timing was a key consideration and a real-time clock with battery backup was included in the design. Also, a human interface device was introduced to allow the operator to know the status of the process control in real time. With seeds held in the starting position in the foam core at the top of the root chamber, water at a pH level of between 5.9 and 6.3 is delivered for the first four days for germination. Nutrients are added on day five to bring the nutrient level to about 1200 ppm. A reservoir has sensors monitoring the temperature pH and PPM levels. Three small support reservoirs with peristaltic pumps will deliver acid, base, and nutrients as required. All the fluids are in a closed system run by a supply pump and drain vacuum pump. Detailed design was created to bring added precision and nutrient fluid flow to multiple grow chambers, determine if the flow was adequate for plant growth, and document the work so this process could be repeated and or improved upon. While we wanted to automate all these functions at this time, we realized we did not know variable values to put into the automated system, so we would first need to observe how the plants grew within this system in order to establish workable metrics. In pursuing this, we soon realized that with the design of these root chambers, we could, with extra manual effort, make a photographic record of the root growth, so that is what we decided to do. As you can see from these two examples, there were noticeable variations even between healthy plants where some roots remained short while others extended themselves. We only had time for one 28-day growth cycle, which did not allow us time to build the vacuum drain, so we opted for a single supply pump with gravity drain utilizing what initially was a 14-liter leak containment base as the primary reservoir. During the 28-day growing period, we continued to refine the Arduino program for light and pump timing. Considering the next stage design emphasis on robotics, we would like to propose an alternate track in which we could uh, increase the biomass output of our current model through continued refinements and growth experiments, use more effective grow lights, reduce the size of the root chambers, increase vertical grow space in the final growing level design and perhaps build a static model of a service cube with the same 50 centimeter dimensions that could extract root chambers and plants from multiple grow cubes, harvest plants, and distribute to food containers, recycle roots and foam, clean root chambers, place new foam encapsulated seeds in cleaned root chambers, redistribute newly planted root chambers back into the grow cubes. This would complete a full cycle of the veggie grow system. This is the point we have come to in our modeling and thought process and look forward to any observations or questions you might have. Okay. I have some slides as well. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Just making sure. Um, so Jack, Allen, and I got together um, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, two months ago. Um, Jack had been doing this by himself at first, and he uh, sent out an email to the Fairchild Volunteer Network and uh, got a hold of Alan and I, and uh, we've been working together since. Um, our results were okay, but they were relative to this one kilogram of lettuce that in the previous presentation, it's, it's nothing, but um, we're still pretty happy with that. We got to grow plants in our system. Um, we got 31 grams approximately of fully grown outrageous, the red romaine lettuce. Um, but we grew in three tiers. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Nick, if you're sharing your screen, uh, we don't see your slides. Oh, you don't see my slides. I'm sorry. There you go. 
you should see them now. I, I forgot to press OK. Yeah. You can. This is where I was. Um, we had 31 grams of edible biomax. That was the leaves. Um, that came from, I think it came out to be 16 plants total within 12 root chambers uh, of Jack's design and 3D printed in the Fairchild uh, makerspace. Um, if we sca staggered the planting like we intend to, uh, we could get triple that every uh, every 10 days harvesting from the bottom tier, which is the tallest one, which I'll show in the pictures here. You can see the different tier heights. Um, initially, you we would germinate and you foam plugs up at the top, and then eventually we'll automate this uh, modular system where you can move these these root chambers from one level to the next. Um, and that'll allow for selection of the best germinated seeds um, because there's more room up at the top with the smaller plants. You can germinate more, kind of like a shotgun method, and then select using some camera analytics where you're looking at multi-spectrum imaging and deciding, okay, this is the strongest seedling, let's move it to the next tier and you know, go on from there. And you can do that with both sections and then move down to the bottom where you have the most space and let them grow all the way. Um, let's go back to this slide. Um, this is just showing some variation we had in, uh, in growth across the different plants. This was a uh, double seated foam plug and we decided not to thin just because this is the first run we wanted to see what would happen with everything. Um, our double seated plugs tended to yield more biomass, though we think that if they were gonna grow for any longer, they would start to compete with each other and, and start to cross problems. So we think that single seeding would lead to a better, a better yield in the long term. Um, let's see what else there's to talk about. Alan went, went, did a really great job um, putting together all of the electronic systems and writing all the code and really just doing a great job um, automating the pumps and the nutrient management and the um, water flow. We ran it on a 10 minutes every hour, I think. 24 hours a day, and the lights were on for, I think, 12 hours a day. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I can't remember. Um, these are some schematics and some, some diagrams that Alan put together. Um, there are some, some future improvements that we want to include. Uh, we want to upgrade our lights because these are just Amazon strip lights, and I think that we could get a better, better yield through you know, better analyzing what spectrum of light these specific plants need. Um, we need to improve our airflow if we're gonna close it, which I think you would have to do in the space station. Um, we were thinking about including like a bioreactor, but I think that you got, we talked about it earlier. Um, I think Joya mentioned that you all are trying to figure out how to, uh, how to compost up in the space station and we had some ideas of, of you know, dissolving uh, wasted biomass, non-edible biomass, and using either bacteria or fungi or you know, uh, enzyme-driven like lysing and, and degradation of, of, of organic material and uh, putting it back to use by dissolving it and making it more bioaccessible um, for the plants, like denitrifying, or not nitrifying, uh, converting it from nitrate to nitrite or nitrite to nitrate. I always forget which direction it needs to go. Um, we also really wanted to include um, multi-spectrum camera analytics and then try and feed that data into like a machine learning algorithm and uh, using that to select, you know, the healthiest plants and maybe diagnose uh, disease or other problems early and uh, just 
all around trying to optimize the system a little bit better. Uh, so yeah, and that's that's the end of it. Are there any, any questions? Hi, hey, Nick. That, that was really interesting. I'm um, very interested in you know this concept of these removable root modules. Is there is there a down selection from like your kind of top like nursery area then to like you would you would pick the biggest healthiest plants to go into the next area is that part of the yes. concept yes okay and are all the roots contained in those modules yes, yes. okay um do you, do they have to be unplugged from the system like when the pump is not running is that <clears throat> Or, or is there a, a valve to keep water from leaking out? Or, or how is that transfer done? I, I can actually uh, speak to that if you'd like, Nick. Yeah, uh, Jack, Jack can answer that question. He, he's really? been trying to find these yeah. uh, leakless, uh, leakless valves. Are, yeah, they're, uh, this initially was designed, I don't know if you got to see, based on a, uh, <clears throat> a um, system where the root chambers can be moved individually uh, <clears throat> with my over microprocessing boards that have generated a, a field and they can be manipulated with a high degree of accuracy. So they actually would be able to un decouple from the manifolds. Okay. Uh, the system cycles uh, three, we did mostly around three minutes every hour <clears throat> uh, seem to be functioning fairly well, although we need to determine that better. Uh, so yes, they would migrate to a larger growing space. We start with 16 in the top level. We eliminate the four of the smallest plants or any that didn't germinate and then advance 12 to the next two levels. They're about every 10 days. So the total output that we gave was about a third of what we'd expect over a 28 day period. Could I uh, interject there a little bit? Uh, well, we will, for removing and, and taking off the, the root chambers, we were looking into like a leakless quick connect valve Mm -hmm. that um, would optimally you know be able to be disconnected and reconnected without disrupting the flow that that's really cool yeah i think i think that's a really interesting um you know view of, of an idea of having like a plant nursery and then transferring to the larger growing areas where you know maybe light will change in the different areas maybe maybe nutrients might increase you know uh, and, and so if you have that ability to to keep pace with plant growth and give them what they want in different stages of their life that makes it really versatile so um one other comment is you know your lights the colors look okay but i'm wondering maybe if the intensity was a little low, because it seemed like your plants were pretty etiolated and, and, and stretched out. Um, I didn't know if you, if you had any readings on your light intensity. Yep. There. Uh, we weren't able to get any PAR readings because we uh, couldn't come up with a PAR meter on hand. They were 440 and 660 wavelength, three to one ratio lights. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we thought that was a case there and that's where we need to improve was on the lighting. And maybe uh, next time around, if we can do this year, maybe we can use uh, the lighting that Fairchild had developed for their yeah. ghost spaces. Would probably be optimum. And they're very thin. They seem to run cool. And uh, so I think, yeah, we can probably thin out the grow chamber, <clears throat> reduce the height, create a spiraling system in the root chamber to grow out, uh, observing the way the roots grew. Even the longer ones would take, uh, have plenty of space. And so we could probably add another three centimeters to the lower three to four centimeters to the lower growth chamber for vertical height and maybe even more uh, because we still had two centimeters extra in each of the uh, upper levels each time we migrated the plants so we could thin those out even more at least for this crop okay i'd like to uh add a little bit more to the spiral uh adding of the root chamber because i think it could be explained a little bit more because it was a pretty cool idea when we were talking about it the other day um, so inside of the root chambers, it's, it's just a circle, right? Mm -hmm. It's a cylinder. Um, and it's just an open space and the, and the roots just occupy that space, uh, like three dimensionally, whatever. Um, we were thinking of, of printing a spiral along it so that the roots would have a longer traveling, uh, path so that they were less likely to get into the drain valve or, uh, or something like that. And you could get a better, you know, surface area distribution of nutrients directly onto the roots, and 
more opportunity for it to, you know, dry and transpire and whatever you needed to do. Yeah, yeah, that, also, well, I was going to say, we're now also thinking about uh, not doing a vacuum system, but going to a misting system, which would also give more air to the plants as well. And just deciding on the, uh, the droplet size uh, that would probably work well in microgravity, uh, providing both nutrients and uh, oxygen or CO2. Okay, yeah, because that was my next question if, with these sealed root chambers, how, how are you going to get the gases into the root zone or the gas exchange in the root zone? So, but you, so you're, you, you're injecting and, and so you would mist inside the root chamber. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. That would be containment too. So droplets wouldn't be going everywhere. So yeah, that could be really. Yeah, I don't know if Alan's, that was more his idea. I don't know if he's uh, available to speak to that issue right now, but he was the one who came up with the idea of the misting over the vacuum system. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so I actually comments, um, positive comments in the sense that you were the only group that I think consciously made the decision to put a, a, a nursery capability into their design. And I think that's, that's important because we're not going to want to, you know, invest time to plants that, that maybe aren't doing well in, in the main growth area. And I think if you look at controlled environment agriculture techniques, that's a lot of how they start up with a nutrient, with a, you know, a nursery set, set, a station. Um, the other thing, since it's my topic today it, for cleanliness, it, it would seem to me to, that if you have the ability to isolate um, the different manifold levels in there, you could have a way where you're now taking something out and cleaning it or, or at least disinfecting it somehow if it's going to be automated uh, and taking only a part of your system offline, perhaps. Um, so think about how you would apply that for the future. Um, you, you set yourself up well in the, in the design for the next you know, the next competition, which is good, thinking ahead like that. So I'll, I'll be curious to see how this evolves over time. Great job. Thanks so much. Thank you. We've been thinking of, of, of some sort of solution to flush through um, to, to re-dissolve some of the, the, the stuff that's left behind. Um, and I was thinking of, of, of like a bioreactor or something like that, but I'm not sure what, what you can get away with in space um, in terms of sanitation and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I don't really know, but I, I do a lot of aquarium stuff and I have, you know, you have to have surface area with nitrifying bacteria and that's just where I was, where I was thinking. If I may ask uh, one question <clears throat> that will majorly influence what direction we choose next, knowing that, uh, creating more biomass comes from letting these plants grow longer rather than the 28 day prescribed cycle in this design. <clears throat> whether we were thinking of sticking to the 28 day harvesting cycle of taking the whole plant or trying to create biomass over time, over a longer growth period and trimming the plants, that would dramatically affect our solution as to how we would choose to harvest and recycle the plant chambers and things like that. So I didn't know if we could receive any guidance on that point. Well, you know, and, and Ralph may have some other comments, but yeah, I mean, we, we originally started with a 28 day one and done, you know, grow it, harvest it. Um, but since the, the very first year of growing beyond earth, the, the students, you know, were, were testing um, cut and come again and repetitive harvesting. And they did show that with the same inputs, we got more than double the, the outputs when we did it for 60 days and we harvested, you know, the older mature leaves from each plant. So it's a lot more like what you would do in your garden. You know, you'll take off the big lettuce leaves, make them in for your salad, you know, every other night or, 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 or once a week or whatever. Um, so I think that type of a sustainable, continuous approach is probably a lot more realistic for, for longer duration salad production than just the one and done. But whether you do, you know, so I think thinking, you know, and all the groups can be thinking about a continuous kind of harvest scenario, um, whether it's we always, you know, we're, we're planting 
new plants on day one and, 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 and harvesting on day 28, and we're always somewhere in that process, or whether we're al always harvesting from the same plants for some period of time. You know, there are trade-offs and different plant varieties might benefit from one or the other approach. Like some, some varieties don't respond well to the cut and come again, some do. Um, you, you increase the potential for disease maybe if you're growing longer plants older. Uh, if you've got these cut surfaces that are seeping plant juices, fungus could colonize them. So sometimes it's better to, to clean out and restart. So it's a trade-off. We can't really say one's better overall than the other, but um, I think thinking of concepts for continuous production is just a really good thing to, to build in. Um, so I, you know, I'm fine either way, I guess is, is my, my take home, but Ralph, so, comments? Yes, yeah, so, and I've seen it, I guess recently, thanks to our lunch and learn sessions, I, I saw where depending on the crop, you might get better performance from cut and come again or a single harvest. Um, but I, I guess I would, would come back with is that really a you know a main driver for this competition um you know that's pretty much how you use it and i don't know if that's if that winds up being a distraction to the overall goal um so i i need maybe some feedback on that yeah so i think i think one of the things that i just want to mention here is that um you know, we're looking at the, the, the next challenge is basically looking at, uh, you know, the, the fully automated system, right? The robotic system. And so um, some of that will be um, outlined in the description when it's released. We haven't quite finished up the details of that. So, um, and we'll determine which pieces of this are going to be important in the next year's challenge once that's finished. So, um, and we'll, and that'll be released, I think, what did we say, August, Tom? September. September. Yeah. So uh, sorry, I didn't mean to push it too early there. Um, but we will, we will um, definitely be releasing what the requirements are for the next one. We're gonna be working obviously with Ralph and Joya and Jacob to determine what the needs are. But, you know, as part of the structure, you know, the third year outline is gonna be more on the, um, the, you know, fully autonomous system, right? So, um, yeah. So we'll, we'll determine whether that's a, you know, that's a single harvest or um, it'll probably be a, you know, We'll talk about that when we release it. Cool. Uh, thanks so much. If anybody else has any other questions other than that, thanks. <laughs> Good presentation, guys. All right. So I know that was a lot of uh, data and information to take in. Thank you all for presenting. Um, we will be announcing the winners uh, at the conclusion of NomCon at 5.30 p.m. Um, go to the Sketch uh, app and you'll see the, the link to that, um, that call. But I'm also linking it in the chat right now if you don't have access to the Sketch. So um, the judges will now deliberate. And we'll make those announcements uh, at 5.30. So we'll, we'll see all the panelists. I mean, so uh, yeah, all the presenters um, later on at 5.30. And judges, if you can move to the deliberation Zoom call that's on the uh, judges notes shared doc. Um, we'll see you all later. Thank you.